Thank you very much. It's good to be here with you today. And I do bring greetings from corn and wheat growers in North Carolina who I think are struggling with some of the same questions that Mark addressed and, and that's probably on your mind, and that is uh, how many corn acres are we going to plant this year and what are we going to do with uh, these low commodity prices? We, we struggled to get 600,000 acres of wheat in the ground in North Carolina after being up in the 900 to a million acres for the last two years. We're going to struggle, I think, this year to get 500,000 acres of corn in the ground after being up in the eight, 900,000 range. I think we're going to help come close to that 4 million bean acreage here in North Carolina uh, the way it goes. So I want us to think a little bit today about how we're going to uh, address these low commodity prices and what kind of strategies we want to have. You know, it is all about being efficient. Mark mentions that. This market's going to try to drive us toward the point of uh, less than profit margins here, and it's going to be up to you to become more efficient. And these are some of the strategies I think you need to be thinking about as you think about being more uh, efficient. First of all, remember yield is the multiplier. You subtract input costs, but you multiply yield. I oftentimes say to corn growers in North Carolina, if you could grow 200 bushel corn consistently, and that's about 40 to 50 bushels over the nationwide average, do you really care what the price is? Now, yeah, they always tell me, yes, we do. <laughs> and they do because they care about their profit margin and how much money they're going to bring home. But you're going to make money any time you can graze 200 bushel corn, at least in today's uh, corn systems. The second and third thing I think corn growers need to think about in these markets today is, first of all, select inputs with a high likelihood of returning value. They're going to contribute to increasing yield. I want to know about them, and I want to utilize them in my corn production system. Or I might select inputs that reduce my risk. And you say, is there such an input in corn production today, something that will allow me to reduce the risk I have of having adverse weather or conditions where that might affect that yield level that I have? And yes, indeed, there is. Drought-tolerant hybrids is one way that we can reduce risk, and we're, talk, we're going to talk just briefly about those in the time that I have here today. So let's talk a little bit about inputs here. That's uh, part of what I think is those key strategies for corn production in 2015, is finding inputs that are going to make a difference and contribute to that yield goal that I have on my farm. And these are some of the things that I think are critically important to maintaining that 180, 200 bushel, 200 plus bushel yields that I think I need to have. First of all, hybrids. And I mentioned drought hybrids, but there's other characteristics of hybrids that you need to be, you need to fit that hybrid. If you got a system where you got irrigation, where you got good soils, where you got that potential for 200 plus bushel, yeah, let's have a hybrid that can realize those goals. If you've got a place where you've got dry land corn, it's sandy, you may not get a rain at just the right time. I want a hybrid that's going to fit that situation. So I think we ought to at least recognize that hybrid is an important part of this. Second, plant populations. I've been known in North Carolina as a proponent of high plant seeding rates and high plant population in cornfield. I think that's the only way to capture the light that we need in order to realize yield. The importance of early growth, nitrogen, I'm not going to touch on that very much here. We've got experts talking about nutrient management here. Uh, fungicide, should I or should I not be using a fungicide in my corn production system? So let's take a look at this. This is one of the ways that I've been looking at it in North Carolina over the last three years, and that is trying to put all these components together in a system. And that's what I'm calling this intensive management. What I've got here is, is six hybrids, six pretty good hybrids for North Carolina. There's a drought-tolerant Aquamax hybrid right there from Pioneer included in this bunch. I've got four locations. These two locations in the eastern part of the state are organic soils, very high productive soils, probably some of our best uh, cornland in the state. The Stokes County location is on a Piedmont soil clay loam. Some of you are familiar with those types of soils. And then Sampson County, that's a coastal plain sandy, very sandy uh, Norfolk uh, um, not quite a Lynchburg or a rain. So it's a, a pretty sandy soil situation out there. What I'm talking about when I mention intensive management under each of these systems, I'm talking about a higher seeding rate, about 10,000 seeds 
above the standard seeding rate in that intensive management. I'm talking about utilizing something to get that corn out of the ground quicker, uh, perhaps an infertile fertilizer or perhaps a seed treatment we've been testing over the last two or three years and looking at trying to get that corn popped up more uniformly, get good early growth. So that's part of that intensive system. Now, in the standard practice, I am using a starter fertilizer in a two by two band, 10 gallons of starter fertilizer, a two by two band. So I'm not, not doing anything to try to get that corn going, but it's uh, I'm enhancing that early fertilizer system there in the intensive management. I'm using a fungicide applied at V8 or, and an R1 and then I may or may not use extra nitrogen. Uh, in most all of these comparisons, even the standard practice, I'm using at least 230 units of nitrogen, and that's that. that should be plenty. Should be plenty of nitrogen for most corn situations in North Carolina. I suspect there's, that's true here for uh, Alabama as well. But you can see here in these comparisons, wherever I have two yellow boxes side by side, Underneath those locations, I had a significant increase in yield due to that intensive management system. And you can see here the locations and situations, or at least hybrid situations, where that occurred in 2014, particularly in Stokes County. Notice the high yield there, 318 bushels. This did get some irrigation uh, at this site there. But you notice in order to get any of these yields of the 180 to 300, I had to use intensive management to get that over that 250 to 270 range that we were in at the standard practice under irrigation. You notice that we did fairly well under a, a sandy loam soil there. In all cases, I increased yield anywhere from 10 bushels and on up using some of these practices. Now, obviously, they come at a higher cost. So I need to know which of these practices really contributed and which ones that I could leave in, in the box, so to speak, and not utilize. So let's take a look at each of, each of these approaches here and which ones helped me most of all in reaching some of those 300 or two, high 200 bushel yields. First of all, the right hybrid. As I said earlier, there's a place to put these hybrids that enhance the value of the system that we had. Now this is that high productive soil in Pamlico County. We also have irrigation at this site, so we're not lacking in water in most years. You notice we were at 200, or in 2012, we were up in the 300 bushel range with some of these hybrids. Uh, even this year, I, some of these yields here were cut short mainly because of Hurricane Arthur that caused some damage. We had potential up in that 300 range at this site in 2014 as well. I've, I've highlighted the average yields here with this red bar here, and you gotta take into account that for, uh, Pioneer, that drought to Aquamax hybrid there, only has two to average and doesn't have that high 2012 year. Even so, I think the trends in 2013 and 14 are fairly indicative of the performance of that hybrid. What do we see here that's interesting at selecting a hybrid for these highly productive irrigation type situations? Well, first of all, these hybrids are good growthy hybrids. This 26, uh, 1615, 1690, or 2088, these are tall hybrids. A lot of growth potential. They tend to be a little longer maturing or later maturing hybrids. A lot of opportunity to capture sunlight and convert it into yield. Even more important, I think the characteristic that highlights these two hybrids is their ability to flex the ear a little bit. That high, uh, uh, tall hybrid has that ability to increase ear size under good conditions. That's the kind of hybrid we want in those irrigated soils. These flex ear type hybrids get that longer ear, that taller stock that allows us to get better sunlight into the canopy and increase our yield potential here. We do not want the drought tolerant hybrid in that situation, nor do we want some of these shorter fixed ear hybrids here, particularly that uh, type that represents that 64-69. Now how about a different situation? Here's that sandy soil in Sampson County, where we don't have irrigation. Now we had some pretty good rain in that site in 2014, like some of you did here in Alabama. But most of the time we can have some dry weather there. And again, I'm highlighting some of these same hybrids. And you notice the hybrids that tend to do better here are these shorter statured hybrids with very fixed or uh, fixed statured ears that have a limited ear length to them. 
that make sure that we fill that ear with kernels and keep that yield level consistent across different drought stresses. There's where that drought tolerant hybrid at least has a potential to contribute to, uh, to our system in those kind of conditions. Here's, here's a direct comparison in looking at these drought hybrids over the last uh, actually three years. I've got two years up here because we put these hybrids at the very same site in 2012 and in 2014. Notice in 2012, that's these uh, yellow bars here, or golden bars if you want to see it that way. Notice in 2014, severe drought. The conventional hybrids here, 64, 69, 1615, 2088, had, were very severely affected. If you look at the Aquamax or the Artesian hybrid there from Syngenta, that basically kept us in the ball game, kept us from losing our lunch, so to speak, there. About a 64 bushel difference if I take the average of these three against the average of those two there. In 2014, we didn't have nearly as severe a drought in this location. It was dry. There's no irrigation here. And they had a long prolonged period there in, in June and early July where we didn't get any rainfall. Even so, our yields weren't too bad. There again, there's the Aquamax Artesian, and then this is the new Monsanto drought guard material right here compared to its isoline, the 6640. Overall, not a big difference. And that's what I'm going to expect under these, these con different conditions with these drought guard materials. They're going to help protect your investment if the weather really goes bad against you. They're going to be about average under average conditions, and when those very good conditions come along, they're going to perform slightly worse than these better hybrids. So that gives you an idea where to place these. They have a potential to protect your risk, but you've got to consider them as that type of thing, an insurance against bad weather. All right, next step, more light, reduce stress. Light is what you're harvesting. That's your factory right there. That's what you're all about. It's, it's interesting to me to go look at these new solar panel centers that they're putting up all over the country, at least in North Carolina. They got these little flat panels there arrayed in rows in a certain direction to north-south, so supposedly to capture as much sunlight as possible. I'll guarantee you that in about four or five years, they're going to be fighting weeds under those doggone solar panels like crazy because they're letting way too much light hit the ground. That's the same problem we have in a corn production system. If you're fighting weeds in your corn crop, you're letting way too much light hit the ground. We need to capture everything that we can and put it into that grain, and that is, is what you're after. This is just a trend line. There's corn yields in North Carolina over that period of time going uh, increasing, uh, and these are the top 15% of the growers, and there's uh, po plant populations increasing at the same time while row spacing is, is uh, going the other way. Here's the key element when thinking about capturing light. You make maximum yield when you capture the most amount of light possible without stress. And that's a hard thing to do, actually. The more light we capture, the more plants we put in the field, the longer we plant, grow that plant, the more likely we are to see some stress in that cornfield that has the potential not just to take away yield, but to damage yield severely under certain conditions. So we play sort of a a game, trading one off against the other in most situations. Here's what I call the good, the bad, the ugly about capturing light. The good, how can we increase light use? Well, there's three ways. Maximizing the length of growing season. We have irrigation and we aren't worried about stress sometime during pollination in this cornfield. We would plant corn as early as we could and get it up in a uniform, consistent manner. In other words, about the first time we weren't worried about a frost on some corn uh, and getting it out of the ground well, we'd be planting because that would maximize the number of days we capture light in a corn system. The later we plant, the more heat units you accumulate per day, the shorter your light capture period is. So for you guys with irrigation, you need to always be thinking, how early can I get corn in the field? in order to get, capture as much light as possible. Of course, I'm going to talk more about plant populations. I think they have the most practical advantage in capturing light, and we can talk about row spacing. I think it has a limitation to what it can do for us, but it still has some contribution. Of course, the stress. 
any time we're putting more plants in the field, we take more water. We're going to put our, set ourselves up for stress and then the ugly. Of course, those corn stalks get mighty thin. And in a year where we get hurricane potential or where temperatures soar, we can have some difficulty in those situations in a high population corn system. This is what population does for us. On the bottom axis, I got plant population, intercepted radiation on this. This, is, this was data taken just after silking time here, so maximum canopy in that cornfield. You can see a different row spacings. There's some advantage to 18 or twin rows versus a 36 rich row, but the real advantage here is by increasing the number of plants. Corn doesn't put on branches like a soybean plant. It puts on leaves and it has a fixed number of leaves. Therefore, if you're going to capture more light, you literally have to put more, more uh, plants in the field. This would suggest that if we're looking for saturated, in other words, taking all the light, which is about 17, 1,700 uh, micromoles per second per meter square, we'd be up here in the 50 to 60,000 plant pop. I don't know of anybody, maybe except some of these high-end growers in the Midwest planting at that uh, seeding rate here today. Here's what uh, higher populations looked like when we compared them head to head in 2014. This is that same set of trials, only this time, instead of the entire system, I'm just looking at changing from 33,000 seeds per acre to 43,000 seeds per acre at each of these locations. And you've got the picture here already. Wherever you see boxes that are highlighted side by side, well, I've got a significant increase in yield. And you notice again that about half the time here, out of these 24 comparisons, about half the time I had a significant increase in yield by increasing plant population to 43,000 seeds per acre. And you notice most of those occurred in Stokes at that high yield system there, surprisingly doing so at Sampson County, even though I'm not sure that that's an ideal population for those sandy soils most year. In 2014, it worked out fairly well even some in some of these better soils these last year. Now, how much is I'm risking? At a $280 bag of seed, $250 bag of seed, I can't remember which I was using there, but approximately $33.80 to acre. I need about $7 or 7.5 bushels to the acre just to return my seed cost to my pocket. How often did I return my seed cost to my pocket in these 24 comparisons? That's how often, about three quarters of the time, that extra 10,000 seeds returned its profit. Seeding rate over the last three seasons where we've looked at these differences has been the most consistent way to return money to your pocket. Now, it can cost you money. We have seen yields go down when we've increased by 10,000 seeds under difficult or stress conditions, but it is a, a way in which you, you match seeding rates correctly to the conditions that you can make money fairly quickly. Now, what is that best way to match seeding rate to the conditions? Well, there's four factors you gotta consider to match your seeding rate. You gotta know whether that hybrid's gonna respond to that seeding rate. Some hybrids don't have much response after you get in the 30,000 range or a little higher. You need to match it to what your water capability, you need to have water to put through all those plants. Fertility needs to be good and then what's your risk? Am I looking at a year where I'm gonna consider drought as being a real possibility, or another 2013, 14, where good decent yields over most of North Carolina, where we had good rainfall? What's my risk of making the wrong decision in this case? Now, here's what I like to use to make, to, to start this process. I like to understand what happens at different uh, productivity ranges to seeding rate, or to at least the maximum, optimum seeding rate. And that's what we've got here. This is actually some data that Pioneer Hybrid put together. You've got here a yield level of about 130, 40 bushel yield. You can see the optimum seeding rate there is about 26,000. Compare that to up here in, a, say, the 200 bushel range here, the optimum seeding rate there about 34,000 for this particular hybrid. If I put a line through that, it looks something like this that describes what my optimum seeding rate ought to be given different productivity levels in my field there. So anytime I get below about 150 yield level 
in that field, it's pretty well a linear drop there toward 20,000 or below. Now, I've had some growers in North Carolina say, well, Dr. Heidegger, I, don't, I very rarely make over 110 bushels per acre on that field, and you're telling me I shouldn't be planting any more than 19 or 20,000 plants in that field. I'm higher than that right now. And I tell them, you need to lower it. First of all, you're not going to make money growing corn like that this year, so why lose so much money by putting that seed in the field? You're going to make 110 bushels with 19,000 just as easy as you would with 26,000. So why waste the money? So indeed, this reflects pretty well what we expect. Now, if I took this and looked at this same relationship for different hybrids, only in this case I'm going to invert this graph. I'm going to put the, the uh, population up here, the productivity level over here. If I look at different hybrids, they have different responses. For instance, there's that 1615, that's sort of a flattened out response versus a 31P40. Or if I looked at a DCAB 6805 or 6803, why that response would be much more linear across that range. There is differences between hybrids for these type of responses. Surprisingly, most hybrids have a very similar response after we get below about 140 bushels to the acre. It's above that level that you really need to be aware of whether that hybrid will respond to that different to higher population. These are some ways to look at fitting your right population to your field condition here year in and year out. How about roast basin? What does it contribute? Right quick, I want to take a look at that before moving to the next topic. What does roast basin contribute to me? Well, certainly we get quicker canopy, so we collect light a little quicker, but that's a fairly minor effect. Here's a good illustration here in this picture of different years of what row spacing actually does for us in, in most of our fields here today and why many growers in North Carolina have considered narrow row spacings as being essential to this drive toward higher plant population. On this graph, well, I've got uh, row spacing going up and down, 20 inch, 30 inch, 36 inch rows is what we represent here. And going sideways is the distance between plants within that row spacing. So we planted the plants at different uh, uh, distances and you can see that then represents different plant populations uh, as we do that. Now which direction, down this way or across this way, do we see the biggest difference in ear size in this uh, illustration? Well, it's not with up and down with row spacing, is it? Most of these ears look pretty consistent between 20 inch and 36 inch rows here, as long as we got six inch or greater spacing between the plants. It's when we move from six inch spacing to four inch spacing between plants that things all of a sudden get very difficult. Corn, it turns out, is an excellent competitor with itself. It competes very well, thank you. And if that neighboring plant has any disadvantage whatsoever to the other, it will become more and more a weed and ear size will become affected. So what does row spacing do? It allows us to plant higher populations and still maintain that distance between those plants down the row, and you can see that here. At six inch spacing, we only got 29,000 plants at 36 inch row, whereas 20 inch, we can go up in the 50s with that same six inch spacing in the, in the plant. And we can see this in some tests that were done in the Piedmont region of North Carolina, there's actually three fields out of, high, there's one field right here, second field right here where this test was done, and a third field right here. What's the largest difference between a wide row and a narrow row in each of these three field situations? The largest difference comes at 38,000, where we got a significant advantage to the narrow row. Again, it's the crowding of plants that really row spacing affects more than anything else. That, Row spacing does some, another thing that we oftentimes don't consider. That is, it does conserve small rain events better than wide rows. In other words, having that canopy closed earlier and having more complete canopy in a narrow row means if you get a half inch rain, more than likely most of that rain is going to go through the soil and through the plant rather than evaporate from the soil surface before it, uh, it penetrates or before it disperses into that soil. So there are some advantages in narrows in conserving water as well as in, in this effect on reducing their plant competition. 
third thing I want to look at here, quick emergence and growth. How important is that to a good corn production system? Well, I think it is everything. I've never seen 300 bushel yields produced when I've come out after two and a half weeks and that corn is struggling up, some of it's uneven in height, a little bit of paleness to it. I've never seen 300 bushel yields on a field look like that. The only 300 bushel fields I've seen is when it is two and a half weeks, it's uniformly emerged, it's bright green, and it's growing like a band out of hell. I shouldn't have said that. Anyway, you got the picture. That's what good looking corn looks like. How do we achieve that? Well, first of all, we've got to get it out of the ground. And it's got to get out of the ground as uniformly as possible. This is a test we did this year. It was based on some comments that I read in Farm Journal about growers who had gone out and measured late emerging plants and seen whether or not they were at a disadvantage compared to their neighbor. So what we did in this test is we went out and the first day I could see spikes out there, I measured out a 20 foot row in these plots and I put little stakes by each of those little spikes I could see. And then I came back 24 hours later and looked and to see whether anything else emerged and sure enough, some more were coming up, so I put a stake by those, and then I came out 48 hours later to see if there were any more, and sure enough, there were a few of those. It turned out about 10% of, of the plants in that 20-foot row section were merged either 24 or 48 hours later. Then I came back with those stakes now marking those plants, and I came back as we approached uh, harvest time, and I took some ears off of those to measure and see what the impact of that delay and planting was. And lo and behold, you didn't have to go look for stakes. All you had to do was go look for the poorest plant in the plot, and sure enough, it had a stake marking that it came up 24, 48 hours later. And this is what these ears look like. There's the untreated control. The only reason I don't have two ears here is on the untreated control, most of those were barren plants. I didn't have an ear to pick. Here I have a, a starter in furrow a little bit better. Here I put some uh, uh, fungicide in furrow. There's a Penelex, it's a nutrient seed treatment on the seed. There's an accomplish in furrow and an axime treatment. None of these have the ears that are just as good as those that came up 24 hours earlier. All of these illustrate the problem with late emerging plants. 10% is way too high. We need to get late emerging plants down under 5 or, part or particularly under 2%. Talk with Randy Dowdy, David Hula, any of the high-end growers that I'll you know, tell you, first of all, uniform emergence, and they're exactly right. Uniform emergence is critical to getting this crop in a position for good yield. Now, we looked at these treatments that we had. I had three locations this past year. We looked at these... Uh, uh, treatments under each of those locations to see if any of them contributed to yield significantly. And I have to say, none of them did anything outstanding in our comparisons. There are some interesting differences here. There's the check. We did put a two by two band of fertilizer, 10 gallons to the acre, in the check. So again, wasn't like we weren't fer fertilizing it to try to enhance that, to, that growth at the earlier. So it wasn't lack of nutrients. The Penelex treatment appears to have worked more consistently across the, it's a nutrient seed treatment. I know others have used it. I'll show you a little more data on it in a minute. It does appear to have some benefits when utilized in, in a high yield system. Uh, Accomplish in the uh, Piedmont region, Accomplish gave us the, the biggest yield. Again, not significant there. We've seen a little bit out of this Accomplish material. It's a bio, biological material here. Again, I don't know that I'm, I'm ready to promote that, but we have seen some responses. Here's what Penlex looked like, where we used it in this uh, intensive management system here. There's what, four out of 24 situations where I got a significant yield increase. Not very exciting when I first looked at this. I thought, well, it was a good try, but no cigar here. However, if you consider what your costs are, it costs about $10.75 an acre, to put Penelex on seed, uh, uh, small amount of material, 2.7 bushels is what I would have needed to have returned money into my pocket. How often did that occur? Well, it occurred a lot. 
That, give, that puts a different perspective on it for me. If I can get a small yield increase, maybe reduce the, the, the number of late emerging plants or at least the health of those plants that are emerging late, there's maybe a potential for this product. I certainly think we're going to try it again in some of our tests. The other aspect of starter fertilizer is, again, we've got to have nutrients through to that early period so that we're ready when that plant is ready to start taking off at B7 during that rapid stem elongation headed toward, toward tassel and silking. This is the time from about B7 to silking where we're going to put on ear size. And that's most critical. We've had a lot of tr uh, tests trying to look at putting more rows on the ear. And we sometimes can influence, but where it really comes into play is ear size. You want to increase that ear size, particularly, as I said, if you have a flex hybrid where you've got good irrigation, high yield potential, you want to influence that ear size. And that has to happen by having it in position. There's a starter. This is a higher rate of starter than what I typically use. There's 20 gallons versus no starter. Very significant differences in, in growth there. Here's some data that we've had out of uh, the uh, uh, sandy, very sandy soil down at the, uh, actually it's the uh, tobacco research center. And you can see here differences up to 40 bushels in having a starter versus a non-starter at that site there, or a starter that included some sulfur, uh, such as this 1027O did with a zinc and sulfur uh, uh, addition. So there's some real bandage in high yield systems. I would never plant corn today without starter fertilizer. Now, having said that, how often do we get our money back out of starter and what's the limits that we can achieve or, or really go for with putting on a starter fertilizer as, as far as returning money to our pocket? Well, here's a, a test. Now, we did this in 2012 in looking at this high yield system with starter and without starter. You notice in one location, I got every, every treatment, I got a significant difference. In the other, only one. And I'll first of all tell you why that happened. At Hyde County, this grower uses a lot of animal waste on his corn systems. It's clear under, under those conditions, starter fertilizer is not nearly as important as it is where we're not utilizing animal waste in our production system. Now, here's where the real rubber meets the road. We're risking at 20 gallons, $70 an acre or higher. I added a, a little sulfur pack or, or something to that. It could easily be in the $75, $80 range for 20 gallons of starter fertilizer on a corn system. I need 16 bushels to the acre or more to break even. Now, how often did that occur here? Actually, one time less then it was significant. That tells me that that's a limit of where we have, can be with starter. We cannot afford to go any higher than that rate, and even there, that rate ha is going to have to be on situations where that starter is going to make a significant yield increase, which isn't all the time. This is a, a, a problem for us. We need starter. I just said we have to have it, but we have to have it at rates and in conditions in which we can afford it. And that's going to differ depending on whether you're using animal waste in your system, what your fertility levels, particularly in the top four. If you're a really good corn grower, really interested in growing corn, you're not just taking a seven, eight inch soil sample, you're taking a top three or four inch soil sample. Because then you will know what nutrient levels you have in that critical zone where that plant is taking nutrients before V7. Then you know whether how much starter to utilize and what types of starter fertilizer, what blends to utilize in your system. This is a critical problem. It's going to cost you more than you can afford if you don't do this right. And yet if you don't do it at all, I can certainly guarantee it's going to cost you more than you can afford in, in losing yield. Finally, let's keep this leaves green all the way to maturity. And there are several ways to do that. I'm going to talk just briefly here about utilizing a fungicide and trying to enhance greenness uh, all the way to maturity. Here's this same uh, scenario, and in this case, we're applying at uh, Quilled XL at B7, B8, so this is about lay-by time or just a little bit later than lay-by, so we're not investing a lot in an uh, airplane to get over the top at R1. So this is a single fungicide application. 
So here's the four locations. Again, draw your attention to the, to the boxes where we had significant differences. I, I'm not totally surprised here, and you shouldn't be either, that we don't have a lot of significance, first of all. And second of all, where did we get most of the time a response? It's in high yield conditions. That's, I think, critical to understand. If you're at B7 and B8 and that corn's already struggling, you're not in a high yield condition. If you're at R1 and that corn's not looking very good or has endured some stress, you're not in a high yield condition. You may or may not need a fungicide then. So high yield conditions, how much did this cost? Well, it, I'm, I'm going to count the application cost here. Typically, if without an application cost, we're looking at $12 to $14 an acre. If I add the application cost, I've got at least another $12 to $14 an acre in this thing. So I'm ta uh, talking about a risk of $26 an acre, six bushel difference. How often did that occur in 2014 on these sites? Surprise, surprise. Or maybe not. We had southern rust in North Carolina in 2014. Came in just after uh, July 7th and spread slowly but surely across most of the state by the time we got to maturity, early enough to make a difference. And sure enough, that little bit of fungicide, even though it didn't significant difference in make it had enough to cover the cost of that application in most of our situations. Is that always going to be the case? Well, here's uh, oh, well, here, I just threw this in just to illustrate that. There's Cryaxer, which was a really good material against southern rust, Quilled XL, and Approach, again, another material that we found to be very good against southern rust. All of them yield significant better than these other materials. How often, though, will that always occur? How about a year where we didn't have southern rust? Well, here, here's the, now this is the $26, so I'm not showing you the yield significant. This is the, the uh, income significance is what I'll try to call it right here. Not very often. Only about six or seven times out of 24 did we return our money to our pocket in 2013. So indeed, disease is going to be a critical factor of when fungicides really pay for you. But on the other hand, as I said earlier, under high yield conditions, I think that fungicide has a high chance of returning money to your pocket and give you something extra in the, in the end. All right, just to wrap it up there, hybrid, as you might guess, is still your best decision. I'd plant it as close to the right population as I could. I'd make sure it got off to the best start. Start a fertilizer of some combination of some type. Even a small amount in furrow can enhance that. And finally, we can be effective with fungicides under high yield conditions or sometimes under stress and disease. I think I got what? Zero time or one minute for a question? <laughs> Are there any questions in one minute? Yeah, there's one right back here. So you're talking about pushing some of the upper yield limits there and talking about, you know, how we're ensuring that our nutrients and everything are met there. How, do, how are you ensuring from the water management side that you're basically not, not either overwatering, but you're keeping them non-stressed the entire time you're doing any monitoring? Or you we estimate we are. are. We're doing some monitoring. I didn't include our irrigation aspect because you guys got some er experts in irrigation talking here, but we're doing an intensive job of monitoring of water use under these intensive plants, and we're making sure that when, when that water uh, hits our critical number that we're getting some irrigation on that. In other words, we're not letting it go under stress. You do not get 300 bushels when you see leaves rolling up. You cannot allow that plant. The same thing could be said about nitrogen. If you're seeing nitrogen to fit, you've already lost too much yield to make a 300 bushel yield. We've got in today's high yield systems to be able to predict what we need a little bit, and that's more difficult. We're doing some monitoring with irrigation. I think that's helping us meet that need. Yeah. When you use some, some seed treatment, how did you treat that corn seed? Well, we're basically running it our, ourselves. We're running it through a, a cement mixer uh, treating it. it. That's one of the biggest problems with utilizing a material like Penelax. Uh, and companies uh, won't guarantee the seed anymore once you've taken it out of the bag and put another treatment on it. So we've tried to work with uh, uh, companies to, to license some people to actually do some treating. Uh, it's very difficult right now with the system that we have or the current uh, 
uh, system in corn to actually put this seed treatment on in a way that keeps your, your uh, guarantee for emergence and still uh, uh, gets it done in a timely fashion. Yes, I, that, I recognize that's a big problem, yes. Have you noticed the problem of germination with the highways uh, we have done some work on looking at that. Uh, our, on our soils, uh, for the most part, and I'm talking about uh, organic soils or, or good loamy sandy loams that have a pretty de decent degree of organic material in them, not, not over 1%, but still a, a decent amount of CEC. Why we're not seeing much uh, disadvantage to going to a 20 gallon rate. If we get over that, it'll, it hurts our germination immediately. Now, I say not di much disadvantage. There, there is some cost to seeding uh, emergence at 20 gallons. So you've got to be very, very careful with these starter fertilizers in that respect. Uh, we've mixed some, some with water. I like that. We've reduced the, the impact on germination. But again, another step that most growers I don't think want to go through is mixing fertilizer with water very often. Yes, I, I really am a proponent of splitting that side dress application uh, up. Uh, quite frankly, here's how I look at, at fertility for corn. First of all, start right. I really need at least 30 units of nitrogen, and we have seen up to 50 units of nitrogen at planting time be necessary in order to reach maximum yield. So you've got to have some nitrogen available right off the start. Then at B, anywhere from B5 to B7, depending on your row spacing, by being able to come in with a, a, uh, the bulk of your 80% of your actual uh, nitro requirement at that time. And then I, I don't mind saving a little nitrogen to drop a little later on, even at B10, last time I can get over it with a high boy. Now, most growers, again, in North Carolina don't do that at the extra trip. So we haven't pr been a big promoter of it, but it will give us another 10 bushels of yield, or 15 sometimes, uh, with a later application like that. But splitting up our nitrogen, I think, is, is important to, to realize in yield and recognizing that you do have to come at, at planting time with some nitrogen. If you do not, you'll never reach that yield that level, that that field's potential for that year. 